If you have your Bibles this morning, would you stand for the reading of Scripture as we look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. We should have this ringing in our head by now. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Father God, as we again explore the fruit of the Spirit this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through the proclamation of your word. Move in our midst through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Stir our hearts to hear what it ha you have for us, God, that we may encounter you in this place this morning and know your goodness. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As you're being seated, I would remind you that this morning we are in the seventh week, the seventh week in our winter-slash-spring series on the fruit of the Spirit. Scripture teaches us as believers that we are to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit in and through our lives. That metaphorically speaking, we are a fruit-bearing tree. And we are to bear the fruit of the Spirit so that it is visible to others in our lives as they look at us. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is produced supernaturally by the presence of God through the person of the Holy Spirit who abides within us as Christians. And this fruit consists of several attributes or, or nutrients that we have been discussing and will continue to discuss for the next few weeks together. Last Sunday, as you may recall, we began our sermon with a matching game for review. And it was kind of fun, I thought. You might disagree, but I kind of enjoyed y'all struggling out there. Is that kind of mechanistic of me? What's the right word? I don't know. But nevertheless, I thought, let's try it again this week. So this week, it's going to be a little bit more hard because, well, we added a attribute last week. So this week, rather than four, we have five. Love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And last week, I asked you to try to match the Greek word that I had shared with you for each one. So this week, we'll try to match the little definition that I've given you for these five nutrients. And so let's begin. The first definition this morning is gladness not based on circumstances. Gladness that's not based on circumstances. Do you remember which one that was? Joy. 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 We can experience joy regardless of our circumstances because we know the grace of God. Okay, the second one this morning, the definition I gave was slow to speak and slow to anger. Patience. That's right. Patience. Now, Beverly's already heard these, so she's a cheater, so we can't give her any credit, right? So, ain't no points for you, but Beverly, that is right. Patience. I wish that I had come up with that term, slow to speak, slow to anger, but that comes from James. It comes from Scripture. We are slow to fly off the handle, slow to react. We think before we speak. Eee, stepping on my own toes there. Let's move on before I get myself in more trouble. Seeks the highest good of others. Seeks the highest good of others. Love. Love. That's right. That was the very first one we talked about. And of course, in a very real sense, all of these emanate from love. It's the foundation. Okay? Merciful, sweet, tender. Kindness, that's right, Lois, kindness. 
We demonstrate kindness in a multitude of ways by showing mercy and caring and helping. The last one is contentment and unity between people. Peace. Peace. That's right, Owen. Peace. We can have an inner peace through contentment. We also have an outer peace in our relations with others. Well, just like last week, y'all did it extremely well. I'm not able to stump you. So, I'm impressed. What can I say? You're, you're listening. You're paying attention. And uh, this week we're going to add number six. The sixth attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, love, joy, peace patience, kindness. Today, goodness. Goodness. Well, let's just follow the same format we've been following. So there on the outline, number one, goodness defined. So let's talk about what goodness is in Scripture. Goodness is demonstrated through a host of moral qualities and characteristics. But most notably, kindness. In fact, the two words, goodness and kindness, are used oftentimes in Scripture interchangeably. Goodness, like kindness, is an expression of God's gracious love, which is shown through a selfless desire to be open-hearted and generous to others above what they deserve. If you do a search of the word goodness on a computer Bible, digital Bible, and you find all of the numerous citations in Scripture of the word goodness, and you begin to read them, the overwhelming majority of the time, the word goodness is synonymous with the word kindness. It's the most common use of the word goodness in the Bible. God shows His goodness to us. Well, in some translations, I might translate kindness. And so it poses a dilemma this morning. Do I just re-preach last week's message on kindness, and every time I'm about to say kindness, say goodness? No. No. Why would the Holy Spirit stir Paul to write in the fruit of the Spirit attributes, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so forth? Why would kindness and goodness be there if they meant exactly the same thing? It would be redundant, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes, there is a tremendous overlap in the meaning of goodness and kindness. And yes, in most cases in Scripture, when it's talking about goodness, you could, you could exchange the word kindness, and it would still be an accurate reflection of what that particular sentence or, or passage was talking about. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is the meaning of goodness that goes above and beyond kindness. You see, goodness is a broader word than kindness. <coughs> and so, let us not forget that much of goodness is conveyed in Scripture as kindness. Don't forget that, but for the purpose of this morning's sermon, since we talked about kindness just last week, I'm going to really focus in on those aspects of goodness that go beyond kindness, that are in that broader meaning of the word. Goodness can be defined, and for the purpose of this series, we're going to go with this simple definition, as moral excellence. Moral excellence. Excellence. According to one of the Bible dictionaries that I read this week, as I looked at multiple ones, it said, Goodness in man 
is not a merely passive quality, but a deliberate preference of right to wrong. The firm and persistent resistance of all moral evil and the choosing and following of all moral good. What this definition is stressing is that when we do good, we do what is right in that which is honoring God. We deliberately choose right over wrong. We deliberately and persistently resist that which is evil, and we deliberately and persistently choose and follow that which is good. In this sense, goodness is speaking about acting and talking with integrity and moral uprightness or righteousness. Goodness is moral excellence. Now in the case of God, we can say it is moral perfection. But in the case of man, you and I, it is moral excellence. Goodness is unique among the qualities listed here in the fruit of the Spirit. Most of them are virtues. They are, they are uh, you know, things that, things that we, we do and or things that we don't do, <laughs> like patience, we don't burst out, we, we wait. Most of them are virtues, but goodness is, is a quality or a state of being. You remember in the opening sermon of the series, we talked about how a good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. Well, the determination of whether the fruit is good or bad is the quality or the, the nature of the tree. Goodness begins with being good. And good is the opposite of evil. You remember in Scripture, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... And when Adam ate of it and Eve ate of it, they had the knowledge of that which was right and that which was wrong. And they realized that they had just done wrong. And in their weakness, they would continue to do wrong. Good and evil. Good is also the opposite of bad. Just like, just like I was just talking about. You might go to a tree and pick off a fruit and you can look at it and determine is that good or is that bad? Is it rotten? Is it, is it spoiled? It's, it's, it's not so much a, a virtue as it is a state of being. Now goodness flows from being good. God is perfectly good. Perfectly good. He's completely pure. He's completely holy. He's completely righteous in every aspect. There is nothing marred or imperfect in any way about God. He is holy, good. And we should aspire to mimic this trait, to mirror His goodness. We'll never reach perfection, but we can aspire to moral excellence to goodness. God is good, and therefore, perhaps, the best way to understand goodness is to understand it as godliness. God is good. We want to be like God. We want to be godly. And to be godly is to be good. Goodness is godliness. 
The Greek word for goodness is agathosune. That's a fun one to say. Agathosune. And for those who are keeping up with these Greek words, it's spelled A-G-A-T-H-O-S-U-N-E. Agathosune. Goodness. Well, hopefully that gives you a general idea of what goodness is. So let's move on to talking about how goodness is exemplified in Christ. Goodness exemplified in Christ. Go with me to Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. Acts chapter 10 Verse 38. The Apostle Peter has come to the home of Cornelius. And he is speaking to the family as he shares with them about Jesus Christ. And I highlight verse 38 when Peter says, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all of those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus went about doing good, stated in another way, demonstrating goodness by the good things that he did. Notice that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Notice that God was with him. Notice that the presence of God upon him was a, a prerequisite for his goodness. He did good things by the power and the presence of God in his life, who is good. Of course, we know that Jesus was and is God and is good. Throughout this series, I have said this statement a couple of times, or probably more than that, that Jesus perfectly exemplifies all of the various attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. And we could go on for a long, long time giving you examples of His goodness, just as we could His kindness, His patience, and so forth. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you a couple. And so let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And there is a man there with a withered hand who is listening to Jesus teach. And Jesus says in Matthew 12, 12, that it is lawful to do good even on the Sabbath day. To do good. To show goodness to others. Now the fact that he said it's lawful to do it even on the Sabbath day is indicative of the fact that he was doing it on all the other days too. <laughs> including the Sabbath day. And in this passage, Jesus shows his goodness and expresses his goodness by healing this man's withered hand. Goodness is often associated in the Gospels with various acts of healing that Jesus did as an expression of goodness. In John chapter 10, Jesus refers to himself in verse 11 as the good shepherd. Now, Jesus is explaining in this passage and teaching that a good shepherd will lead his sheep, he will care for his sheep, he will protect his sheep, he will provide for his sheep, he will do whatever is necessary for the well-being of his sheep, because that's what a good shepherd does. And ultimately, Jesus says, a good shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep. And of course, Jesus is forecasting exactly what he would do on behalf of fallen mankind. Jesus laid down his life so we might be forgiven of our sin and receive salvation in His name. Through His grace, 
Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection are the ultimate display of his goodness. How he extends his goodness to us by offering us salvation. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the Son of God. He is the second person of the Trinity. He plainly stated in the Gospels on a few different occasions, but I will point to you in the same chapter we were just in, John chapter 10, in verse 30, He said without any ambiguity whatsoever that He and the Father are one. John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Now there are critics out there who try to, uh, you know, nitpick, and they say, well, Jesus didn't directly say he was God. Well, if you look a couple of verses down in that same passage, the people that were standing there that day responded, how dare you call yourself God? So apparently they they understood he was claiming to be God. How can we not make that connection? On other occasion, on other occasions, Jesus said that he was I am, a reference to the name that God used for Himself with Abraham, with uh, Moses. <laughs> well, brain freeze for a minute. Jesus said, clearly, I am God. Now, we understand that to mean that Jesus is of the same nature, the same essence, and the same being as the Father. He is God. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. Therefore, any time that the Bible says that God is good, it applies to all three persons of the Godhead. And the Bible says God is good many times. I'll just give you a couple of examples I wrote down. Psalm 100. Verse 5 says, The Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting. There are double-digit appearances of the phrase, God is good, the Lord is good in the Psalms. First Chronicles 16.34 says the same thing. The Lord is good, His loving kindness is everlasting. And I just wrote on here, etc. Because I could give you numerous, numerous scriptures that say the repeated theme of Scripture, one of the repeated themes, and that is that God is good. And therefore, if God is good, then Jesus is inherently good, because Jesus is God. So Jesus exemplifies goodness. Now the final point this morning is a little different than what we've had before. I'm calling it today the elusiveness, the elusiveness of goodness. When some when something is elusive, it, it's hard to catch, it's hard to grab a hold of. The elusiveness of goodness. And I'll begin this final point this morning by looking at a scene in the ministry of Jesus that on the surface might seem somewhat contrary to what we're talking about today. It's recorded in multiple Gospels. Let's look at the version of it recorded in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 17. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but, but let's look at a couple of, of these verses. It says, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, 
Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now let's just stop right there and explore what might, at least on a casual, lazy reading, seem to be a contradiction. Pastor, didn't you just say in John chapter 10 that Jesus called himself the good shepherd? Jesus called himself good. Yes, I did say that because it happened. And yet here, as we're reading in Mark, when this man approached him, which by the way we, we call the rich young ruler, when he approached Jesus and called him good teacher, Jesus stopped him and said, Hey, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. And so, which is it? Is Jesus good, which he said, or is Jesus not good? Which it appears he may have said. Well, this passage highlights the dual nature of Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is fully God and fully man simultaneously. I mentioned the Trinity a while ago, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is 100% God. The Son is 100% God. The Spirit is 100% God. And yet they're three distinct persons. But they're all fully God. They're not one third each God. They're all God. Well, Pastor, the, the math doesn't add up. I know. <laughs> it's beyond our human ability to understand. But that is the teaching of Scripture. In the same way, when we look at just Jesus, Jesus was 100% God. And he was 100% man at the same time. He wasn't 50-50. He wasn't half man, half God. He was fully God and fully man at the same time. And again, it's beyond our understanding as a human being how that works. But with God, all things are possible. So we accept it by faith. Now let's get back to the point. With respect to his deity... Jesus would not hesitate to teach that which is true, that he was and is wholly good, because God is good. But with respect to his humanity, Jesus refused to refer to himself as good, due to the weakness and limitations of his flesh. Now here's the, here's the amazing thing. Even in his fleshly humanity, Jesus lived a perfect life without sin. So in his humanity, he was as good as a person can possibly be. But it is revealing that even Jesus himself, with respect to his humanity, did not call himself good. There are two interpretations of this passage. One being that Jesus declined to call himself good because he was talking about his humanity and the weakness and limitations of his flesh. The other is, Jesus never said, I'm not good. He just said, why do you call me good? None is good but God. So maybe what he was trying to indicate to the rich young ruler is, nobody's good but God. You're calling me good, so what, who does that tell you that I am? I'm God. Now while that would be a, a possible interpretation, and I would love if that was true, unfortunately if you read what the rich young ruler said, I don't know that he really realized that Jesus was God. But maybe Jesus was teaching in that respect to try to get his eyes to open to see the reality 
of who he was. Nevertheless, it points out the stark reality that in our flesh as human beings, we are by both nature and choice less than good. Let's take Jesus off the table here because Jesus was a God-man simultaneously. And let's just talk about those of us who were just people. We're not God in any respect. We're people. We are creations of God. And in our humanity, we are by nature and by choice both woefully sinful, corrupt, and unholy. The Bible teaches that there is none good, no, not even one. In fact, it says it twice. First time in Psalm 14, 3, and then later Paul in the book of Romans repeats it in Romans 3, 12. There is none good, in some translations, there is none righteous, none who do right, none who do good, none who practice genuine goodness. No, not even one. Because before you can demonstrate genuine goodness, as we said a while ago, you have to be good. A bad tree does not produce good fruit. Jeremiah wrote it this way in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You see, here's the reality. People are intrinsically evil. People are intrinsically corrupt. People are intrinsically bad in terms of our quality. We are rotten. We are sour. We are broken. We are fallen. And as such, we cannot practice genuine goodness. Because it is contrary to our nature. And here's where we get to the title of this point that I'm making this morning, the elusiveness of goodness. Here it is. No amount of good deeds can change the reality of who we are. In other words, what I'm saying is we cannot become good by demonstrating goodness or by doing good works. This is the elusiveness of goodness. We can try and try and try to become good by being good, but the reality is we can't. In fact, all of the good that we do is for naught unless we are first good by the saving blood of Jesus Christ. The only way to become good in the sight of God is through faith in Jesus. When we trust Him for salvation, Scripture says He makes us righteous and good by the power of His grace. And this change enables us then to do the good works that God has set before us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And it is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And we have been prepared in Christ. We are His workmanship to do the good works that He has laid out before us to do. You see the sequence there? God makes us good through faith in Christ by His grace. And after making us good, then He allows us to do the good works that He has prepared in advance for us. The acts of goodness that we do don't go before salvation, they come after. Don't put the cart before the horse. We cannot do good unless we first are good. And the goodness that we do is a reflection of the goodness that we have in us and our, our being, our quality, because we have been born again. Now, what happens when we're born again? 
God calls us to show goodness. To demonstrate the good that lives within us. Godliness. Goodness. And as we do these acts of goodness, we testify of God's goodness. Let your light shine before men so that they see your good works, your goodness, and glorify your Father who is in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. When we demonstrate goodness, we demonstrate godliness. And we are a testimony to God. God urges all Christians to do good and to not grow weary as we show goodness. Well, let me conclude this morning. God also demonstrates His goodness through blessings and through answered prayers. Like a loving father who knows how to give good gifts to his children, Scripture says in the same way God showers goodness on those who ask for it. Matthew 7. Verse 11. In fact, the Bible teaches that every good and perfect gift we receive comes from God. James 1.17 So every good thing we have, every good thing we receive, and every good thing then that we give or share or convey is given to us by God. Amen. He is the source of all goodness. If you see something good, you can know that it came from God. This morning we sang, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now, where does that phrase come from? The 23rd Psalm. You see, David was confident that God's goodness would follow him all the days of his life. He was confident that God's goodness would follow him because he was a believer and had faith and trusted in God who is good. And as Christians today, we can have that same confidence because we have trusted in Jesus. And he is good. There on your outline, at the bottom, it says, We serve a good God. We serve a good God. And this good God makes us good through Jesus Christ. He is good. He's the source of all good. He makes us good. And the reason He makes us good is because He calls us to do good things. He calls us to do good. He calls us to exhibit goodness. And we should seek to emulate His goodness in everything that we do. To show the goodness of God. As I prepared the message this week, I couldn't help think of an event that occurred about three and a half years ago. Janice and I were on our 25th anniversary, you may remember, back in 2018, and while we were gone, we received a call that my mama's dad, my peepaw, had passed away. And a few days later, we went down to Conroe, and I was blessed to have the opportunity to... to give a eulogy with, with my cousin at, at his funeral. And the reason that came to my mind is because that was the last time that I have done a message on goodness. Goodness. Because my people, who is one of my heroes in the faith, and one of my heroes just in life, was... One of the most genuinely good people that I've ever known in my life. He was kind, which we talked about is a large part of goodness. But beyond that, he was honest. He was 
upright. He was truthful. He was courageous. He was forgiving and generous. And he believed the best in people. He was a great leader. He was a person that when I was around, I could just sense goodness. I could feel goodness coming from him. He was a good man. But even in that, he was a man. And all of the goodness that my people exhibited was from God. Jesus, the perfect example of goodness. His goodness is beyond what we could ever attain or reach. And he is good because he is good. It's who he is. And so our prayer this week is that we might, to the degree that we can, achieve the same moral excellence that Christ modeled for us. And while we may not get to the perfection, that we aspire to reach that plane of goodness so that others might look at us and see Christ in us as we display yet another attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. Let's close. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for this message. Lord, goodness can be manifest in so many ways. But in essence, when we aspire to live godly lives, we demonstrate goodness. Lord, you have made us good through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that we would be we would be quick to show that goodness in our words, in our deeds, in our speech, in our thoughts. God, that we would demonstrate the quality of goodness in us that others might see you based on the evidence of the fruit that we display in our lives. For we ask it in Jesus' name.